Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and I'm about to convene this, this afternoon's meeting. The first item on the agenda will be the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I first want to announce some upcoming meetings. So this evening, we, the board will conduct its primary care advisory group meeting starting at 5 p.m. And, the, and it goes till seven. The link is on our website. And then next week, I just wanna remind folks that we'll be hearing um, from, an, we'll have an all day meeting. It's starting at 11. We're gonna take a break at about uh, one and then come back at, we'll probably work until the first session is over and then we'll come back in the afternoon. We're gonna hear um, as related to our sustainability planning with the hospitals per 159 of 2020. In the morning, we're going to hear about uh, price and costs in the hospitals. And then in the afternoon, we're going to hear about the capacity and quality. Uh, so I just wanted to remind the board and the public that that will be happening next Wednesday. And again, note this, the time starting at 11 a.m. I also wanted to announce a uh, public forum that the state is uh, conducting. And um, in conjunction with this, let folks know that there is a new website on the Department of Financial Regulation website that uh, is a link to the uh, 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 issue on wait times and the investigation that the state is pursuing. Um, on this website, you will see that there are two listening sessions occurring. The first one takes place again next Wednesday, busy day for state folks, uh, starting at 5.30 in the evening and going till 7.30. And then the next one is at uh, on um, November 4th, and that starts at 12 and goes to 2. The links are available um, both on the, the link to the website on DFR is available on our uh, GMCB website, but I'd encourage folks to take a look at the information. There's also a landing page where uh, consumers can share their stories of wait times if they have them. And um, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that. I know uh, the uh, Jessica Holmes, board member Holmes, will be at those listening sessions representing the Green Mountain Care Board. And then last but not least, I, we do have several public comment periods ongoing, so I want to announce those as a reminder. First, we've opened an, on a, a public comment period on the draft healthcare workforce strategic plan, which we will hear from uh, the director of healthcare reform momentarily on that. That is um, That public comment period opened on October 15th and we will close that on Monday, November 1st, 2021. We'll also be sharing uh, the draft healthcare workforce strategic pan, plan with our upcoming general advisory committee meeting, which I, I forgot to announce, which is Monday, October 25th. The next public comment is on the prescription drug technical advisory uh, meeting or subgroup. We had a meeting last week where they where a subgroup uh, put forth some of their recommendations. So we are offering a public comment on that information as well. And that goes until October 25th. The next is regarding the FY22 guidance and reporting requirements for Medicare only non-certified accountable care organizations. That public comment period ended yesterday and I know Russ McCracken will address the results of that in his presentation. And then we also have before us the One Care Vermont FY22 budget and we are accepting public comment. Uh, we opened that on October 1st will accept um, public comment until November. Um, I'm looking at this date here. Our presentation for, to the board is uh, November 10th from staff. So we wanna make sure if you do have public comment, you get that in before the 10th. And then last but not least, we have an ongoing public comment period on the potential next agreement with the federal government on, the, on an all pair model the administration
You just went silent, Susan. Somebody muted me. I was going on too long. <laughs> well, you've heard this one several times from the, I announced it at every meeting, that we are conducting an ongoing public comment on a potential next agreement. And we are sharing any of those comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading that those negotiations. And I am finally done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, October 13th and Friday, October 15th. Is there a motion? I move them. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agendas of Wednesday, October 13th and Friday, October 15th without any additions, deletions or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motions were approved unanimously. So now we're going to get down to um, really the, the heart of today's meetings. And I did want to um, um, at least call out uh, one member who has joined us today, and that is um, Beth Stearns from Senator Sanders' office. And Senator Sanders has been very dedicated to workforce issues, especially when it comes to nursing. And um, we at the Green Mountain Care Board have pledged to work with him as he strives to do what can be done. Um, he's taken some great steps, such as trying to triple fund the National Health Corp and um, putting uh, $14 million more into GME dollars. And so, um, uh, Beth, we're very grateful that you're able to attend today, and we look forward to continuing um, to work with you to try to make sure that uh, there is an adequate workforce in Vermont. Great, thank, so with, thank you. I'm really interested to hear the presentation today. So thanks so much. And with that, I'm going to um, tee up uh, the, the presentation, which we're about to hear from Ina Backus. Ina has been tirelessly working on the strategic uh, plan for workforce development in healthcare. And um, she's had a lot of help with some great people that she pulled together um, to um, work with her on this. And I know that, uh, for example, um, Vaz has participated, as have many, many others. And I know that uh, Ina's grateful for all that uh, help. And what we have in front of us um, to review is really um, something that uh, um, I've been waiting to see for a while. And uh, I just want to uh, thank Ina in advance for all the, the work that she's done to date. And it's something that, you know, too often um, people just believe that there is a shortage of workers, period, and, and healthcare doesn't always rise to the top. And yet, we end up paying in healthcare no matter what. We pay in both dollars and we also pay in quality. So at current, we've heard that um, some people, including Ina's boss, are paying $200 an hour for travelers. And uh, that just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And yet our hospitals can't uh, turn somebody away at the door. They have to treat everyone that comes in. And so they're forced to hire travelers at a much higher cost. So we're paying for it um, in terms of what we're paying for healthcare and we're paying for it in quality. These travelers are incredibly dedicated professionals, but when you're not um, a long-term um, worker in your setting, you don't know the equipment as well as somebody that is. You don't know what other um, services are available in the area and uh, a whole slew of things that draws down on the quality. So anything that we can do to grow our own supply of healthcare professionals in the state of Vermont uh, is so essential. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ina Backus. And I know Ina that uh, 
everyone is anxiously uh, awaiting to hear what you have to say. So welcome. Thank you. It's good to see everyone and thank you for the introduction, Chair Moen. I, I do have a lot of gratitude for the advisory group that uh, worked um, to inform this plan for workforce development, healthcare workforce development in the state of Vermont, as well as the uh, uh, many uh, professionals from across state government that also contributed to this plan in an informal capacity um, and specific to their expertise in a variety of ways. Um, and, and Chair Mullen, your attention on this issue over the years is also much appreciated. Um, you've been an outspoken proponent and supporter of healthcare workforce development activities, and um, that is certainly appreciated. And um, and this strategic plan, I hope, will help to um, bring bring us forward in the coordinated approach to address the healthcare workforce issues today. Shall I share my materials or will they be shared on my behalf? Which would you prefer? Um, I, I, either way. Well, either if you're way. comfortable driving, go ahead and drive. Absolutely, I'll do that. Can everyone share, uh, see my screen? Yes, we can. Is it, um, I can move it into the slideshow mode if that would be better or? It would be better, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Act 155 of 2020 was an act relating to increasing the supply of nurses and primary care providers in the state of Vermont. And this legislation established that the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services uh, shall maintain a current healthcare workforce development strategic plan. The key word here being current. And so this, this uh, strategic plan here is now a current strategic plan version. As the board well knows, the last um, workforce development strategic plan that it approved was in 2013, I believe. Um, the, uh, in establishing and maintaining the current uh, strategic plan, the director should consult, shall consult with an advisory group composed of 11 members. Here are the members of the advisory group for your review. Um, the membership did need to include one member of the Green Mountain Care Board's primary care advisory group, a representative of the Vermont State Colleges, the Area Health Education Center's Workforce Initiative, federally qualified health centers, representative of Vermont hospitals, of Vermont physicians, of mental health professionals, dentists, naturopathic physicians, home health agencies, long-term and long-term care facilities. And Act 155 required that the Director of Healthcare Reform or designee chair this advisory group in service of creating the healthcare workforce development strategic plan. As I already mentioned, I am very grateful for those um, who participated in the development of this plan um, from different areas of state government, as well as um, those who uh, participated informally in the group, not as advisory members, but joined discussions um, at different periods of time. <sighs> Are you seeing the slides advance? Uh, we're still on the advisory group membership slide. So am I. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, the advisory group explored a large range of topics related to workforce development. Um, including a comprehensive assessment of workforce development uh, challenges and opportunities in the following areas of coordination, 
data and monitoring, financial incentives, education and training, regulation, practice, recruitment and retention, and federal policy. As I said, or as I may not have said, the plan is really focused um, on nurses, primary care physicians, dental care providers, mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals that are working in all settings, including acute care, long-term care, medical office settings, in-home settings, community-based settings, dental and mental health, and substance, substance use disorder treatment settings. We acknowledge in the plan that future work is necessary to delve more deeply into the barriers for non-licensed allied health, direct support professionals, um, persons working as personal care attendants and home care aides, peers and community health workers. Um, these, these workers are also in short supply in the healthcare workforce and are absolutely essential uh, to the workforce. So we, in the plan, uh, make clear um, that in addition to some recommendations related to this cohort of the workforce, that further, further work is also needed in this area. The strategic plan builds on and updates recommendations from the Rural Health Services uh, Task Force Workforce Subcommittee Report of 2020. So you're also familiar with that report um, and uh, that report really served um, as a critical anchor and starting place for our group's work, particularly given the proximity and time uh, between the advisory group's work and the work of the um, Rural Health Services Task Force Subcommittee. As well, there was significant overlap in the participants um, in those groups. So we were able, in some senses, to pick up, pick up where um, those recommendations left off. In the category of coordination of healthcare workforce development activities in the state of Vermont, uh, the report makes two recommendations. And these recommendations are very much necessary in order for the later recommendations in the strategic plan to be organized in such a way um, where there is accountability and coordination um, for accomplishing those recommendations. So we recommend to, that uh, there be an interagency task team uh, from the state of Vermont and that at a minimum this task team should include the Agency of Human Services, the Agency of Administration, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Department of Labor, the Agency of Education, and the State Chief Prevention Officer. As you'll see as we work through the re recommendations in the plan, many of the recommendations do rely on coordination among different actors in state government as well as in the private sector. And we believe that a um, team that is identified to coordinate um, with one another as well as with um, the healthcare workforce is a critical component to carrying out these recommendations. We also recommend that the State Workforce Development Board um, be integrated with, or rather that the Healthcare uh, Workforce Development Advisory Group be integrated with the State Workforce Development Board um, to ensure alignment with overall workforce development initiatives um, and to um, certainly ensure that, that healthcare workforce needs are, are clearly reflected. The Healthcare Workforce Strategic Plan Advisory Group uh, would serve as an official subcommittee to the State Workforce Development Board and the advisory group would be integrated in a manner to ensure that the strategic plan implementation is aligned with broader workforce development initiatives in the state of Vermont. Healthcare workforce data resides in numerous places this is a theme um, that is carried through in, in revisiting past workforce development strategic plans, workforce development reports, 
um, in the state of Vermont that healthcare data uh, resides in numerous places um, within state government and outside of state government. And further, there are some significant gaps in the healthcare workforce data that exists today. I mentioned earlier um, the importance of, of supporting activities for the non-licensed uh, healthcare provider, non-licensed um, care providers in the state. Those are a key example of data that we do not have at this time. Um, data about non-licensed direct care providers doesn't exist in, in, in a way where it can be incorporated with um, a larger set of data. Data to describe demand, such as employer vacancies, retirement projections, um, et cetera, are not clearly uh, integrated in um, a view of healthcare workforce data. The court, we recommend that a, a, lead age, uh, a lead entity is identified as the healthcare workforce data hub, and that this data hub um, be uh, Re that this data hub would be responsible for aggregating all relevant workforce data, including data from Vermont's talent pipeline. The entity identified data gaps, um, such as uh, what I just um, named, as well as other data gaps that may exist regarding healthcare workforce data, and that this entity issue regular monitoring reports uh, no more than every two years to inform um, policymakers and others about the status of Vermont's healthcare workforce. Further, we recommend that supply and demand modeling be employed in the state of Vermont to track uh, healthcare workforce. The healthcare workforce data hub should explore and recommend an ongoing process and necessary funds for healthcare workforce supply and demand modeling for use by healthcare employers, healthcare educators, and policymakers. This supply and demand modeling could become an input uh, to um, your own health resource allocation plan as an example of um, its use by uh, policymakers and regulators. The next category or domain for uh, uh, recommendations in the report is the category of uh, financial incentives for healthcare workers living and working as permanent employees in Vermont. Um, this, these recommendations really break out into two categories, as you can see here, uh, offsetting educational costs, so financial incentives um, and offsetting educational costs as well as financial incentives that would promote permanent healthcare employment and residency in Vermont. The cost of education for healthcare providers is a barrier to growing the pool of healthcare professionals working in our state. And um, there are existing programs. Whoops, I'm hearing a little echo. Um, it's your, your screen that's uh, flashing blue. So maybe Tom, you could put yourself on mute. Go ahead, Ina. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as, I, as I was describing, certainly the cost of education was cited as, as a key barrier for healthcare providers uh, and barrier for growing the pool of healthcare providers working in the state. We have existing programs of loan and repayment that include service agreements um, where the recipients are required to practice in the state of Vermont. Um, in this this model, we have the programs are already highly subscribed. Um, they are competitive programs, and not all applicants receive or will receive awards. Uh, in 2019, only 59% of applicants received awards. The funding um, through these loan repayment programs has largely been allocated for MDs and APRNs. Um, as you're aware, healthcare employers are increasingly uh, so related, so that's related to the educational costs. Um, related to promoting permanent healthcare employment and residency in Vermont, 
healthcare employers are increasingly relying on costly traveling staff to ensure access to care for Vermonters. By the end of 2021, Vermont's hospitals are projecting to have spent more than $75 million on non-employed temporary traveling staff that are hired through staffing agencies. In a communication to the advisory group, um, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems reported that Vermont providers continue to leverage staffing agencies more than ever. I think you heard this in your um, discussions of the hospital's budgets. Um, the use of travelers um, for hospitals has increased um, and the total costs associated with these services has increased 50% from 50 million to 75 million um, that I share. Skilled nursing facilities are another example, um, and there are many other examples of healthcare providers that are relying on costly traveling staff, um, Chair Mullen, as you mentioned uh, at the start of this report. And so these recommendations are, are um, again, both recommendations to offset educational costs and recommendations to promote healthcare employment uh, and residency in the state of Vermont. In terms of broadening, so the first recommendation to broaden and expand loan repayment, um, we recommend that based on an evaluation of existing data and potential new sources of data, that the area health education center should develop a proposal for expanding its service-based loan repayment program to include more healthcare professionals and professional types and to increase the current program offerings. Recommendations should include the funding necessary to increase loan repayment programs, as well as the funding necessary for including additional professional types. Increasing scholarship funding created by Act 155 of 2020 and identifying permanent a permanent funding source is also a recommendation. Uh, Act 155 of 2020 not only created this advisory group, but also created new scholarship pro programs for nursing and primary care professionals um, that are also contingent on service agreements. I think that service agreements um, uh, that are tied to financial um, incentives are incredibly important for um, ensuring that those who receive um, uh, assistance are are then practicing in the state of Vermont as health care providers for a given period of time. Uh, the interagency task team uh, implemented per the recommend the, the interagency task team um, which we recommend be established um, it should recommend whether and how these scholarship and service opportunities should be expanded to more healthcare professional types and recommend an ongoing funding source. We also recommend evaluating the effectiveness of the existing scholarship program available to Vermonters who attend dental school. And here the Vermont Department of Health in collaboration with the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation and AHEC should evaluate and revise the dental scholarship program as needed to align with other pipeline and recruitment strategies. And the final recommendation in the offsetting of educational costs category is to make financial assistance options for healthcare workforce clear, transparent, and easy to find. And this is especially true in light of some recent um, changes and potential changes to uh, the availability of funding opportunities such as the public service loan forgiveness program um, as well as uh, the very recent um, although uh, changes in terms of national health service core funding that is available now uh, to the promoting permanent health care employment and residency in vermont we recommend that uh, we revisit the tax incentive proposals that have been made by the administration. The tax inter the state interagency task team should evaluate incentives utilized by other states to recruit young professionals 
and healthcare workers to live and work as permanent residents of a state. Um, this includes ideas or existing programs such as the main opportunity tax credit, uh, the governor's nurse retention tax incentive, which I just referenced, and uh, the potential for multi-year tax exemptions. The team should also consider tax exemption for preceptor income to encourage more health care professionals in Vermont to participate in educating new professionals. Further, the task team should consider whether tax incentives should be offered to employers who are offering housing or other benefits to permanent full-time employees. And the task team should recommend to the legislature whether an expanded tax incentive model holds potential for recruiting a broader set of healthcare professionals to live and work as permanent employees in the state. The advisory group and this report also recommend uh, that there be work to identify the financial barriers to recruitment and retention of the non-licensed workforce. Also, um, the interagency task team should also look at this issue to understand what barriers exist for the non-licensed professional workforce um, to participate in the healthcare field in Vermont. And consideration should be given here for uh, benefits cliffs, housing costs, transportation, uh, childcare, and competition from other industries. We also recommend that uh, there be consideration of one-time funds for employers to attract uh, permanent employees. Um, specifically, the state interagency task team should identify funds to be made available to a range of healthcare employer types to offer incentives such as sign-on bonuses, retention bonuses, relocation assistance, and housing support for permanent employed staff. Uh, in this proposal, we would expect that these types of benefits be linked to service agreements, again, or contracts with healthcare employers um, so that uh, the workforce is dedicated to working in Vermont for um, a set period of time. We also recommend consideration for longer term, a longer term grant incentive program Again, the task team uh, should evaluate what opportunities there might be for a longer term grant incentive program to entice professionals, healthcare professionals to seek permanent employment and residency in Vermont. A program like this could be modeled after or could expand on the remote worker grant program. Moving now to the recommendations in the education and training domain. There are not enough clinical educators and preceptors to educate healthcare workers in the state of Vermont. I think likely, uh, Chair Mullen, that that is something you've discussed before uh, with, with the board. There are more persons who want to work in Vermont in healthcare professionals than can be educated in our current system. Uh, precepting places significant demands on healthcare organizations and preceptors are not adequately compensated for the one-on-one -on -one instruction that they provide to students in the healthcare professional professions. And more opportunities um, can also be created to streamline the path of licensure um, for nurses specifically so that employees can work and earn. Um, I think there's also you know, a, a, a big topic of discussion as well um, in, in, our, um, in our advisory group uh, was, was really a, around how we support people in moving through the uh, healthcare pipeline um, and at any point in the healthcare pipeline as well. Um, and so there are certainly, there are certainly activities that can um, streamline advancement through the nursing career ladder and also that can provide for upskilling of existing staff. Um, as an example, the legislature appropriated funding for a joint project between VTC and skilled nursing facilities to create new LPN slots designated for current LPNs that are working in facilities. 
means that these, these individuals can continue working uh, while participating in educational programming that would be provided on site um, in nursing facilities across the state. And these facilities um, were, the, the program provides for funding to cover tuition and fees necessary for prerequisite courses um, and the LPN program, as well as a stipend for those students, um, those students who would need to uh, reduce their work in order to accomplish their coursework. So the recommendations um, in this arena include increasing enrollment in nursing programs. And here we recommend that the Office of Professional Regulation facilitate a work group between schools of nursing and clinical sites uh, and health, clinical sites and healthcare organizations to establish a preceptor model of clinical training to maximize opportunities for student nurses to obtain required clinical time and minimize the need for nursing programs to recruit additional faculty. The work group should consider preceptor shifts across the care continuum, including home and community-based settings. The work group should also evaluate any gaps in compensation between academic faculty and practitioners, identify possible solutions, and make any further recommendations necessary, including funding. The work group should also consider how nurses transitioning to retirement could be incentivized to work as nurse educators. And the work group should identify any additional barriers um, to increasing enrollment in nursing programs in the state of Vermont. The advisory group also recommends support for transition to practice programs for professional roles. Uh, here, we recommend that um, the, uh, the state interagency task team explore American Rescue Plan Act funding to make startup investments and in transition to practice programs. These investments will offset the cost of hiring new graduate clinicians and support infrastructure uh, and instructors. The state interagency task team should evaluate opportunities for ongoing program funding. Organizations seeking funds for transition to practice programs would be required to complete an application and participate in a selection process. We really heard clearly that um, it's difficult for employers to bring on new graduates because those graduates really do require um, a, a time um, of training and residency um, in order in order to be um, integrated um, and as successful as possible in the field. Uh, without this time and dedicated resources for this work, it can lead to frustration and burnout for these new nurse graduates who are who are entering um, the workplace um, really for the first time. We also recommend strengthening incentives for preceptors for all professions. Here, the University of Vermont College of Medicine in collaboration with primary care physicians should identify and implement appropriate incentives for preceptors such as payments for teaching, access to training and career advancement, faculty appointments, or preceptor income tax exemption. We also uh, recommend that um, as leading the University of Vermont College of Medicine explore opportunities to expand family practice residency programs. Um, this work in collaboration with primary care physicians um, should convene a work group to explore opportunities to expand and fund family practice residency training and retention opportunities with an emphasis on increasing the number of family medicine physicians who are trained and remain in Vermont. We also recommend modifying the curriculum to introduce primary care earlier in medical school. The University of Vermont College of Medicine should modify the curriculum so that medical students um, see more emphasis on primary care. Um, for example, students should start rotation with primary care early on in their programs and continue that into the second or third year. We also recommend establishing a physician assistant education program. 
Here, the Vermont State Colleges should study and provide a report to the legislature on the potential to offer a physician assistant education program, including an analysis of employer demand for the program. The study should include a timeline to implement, uh, imp implement and identify the financial resources necessary to develop, equip the staff and operate such a program. And this should include a timeline to obtain uh, accreditation and set up the first cohort. We also recommend modifying the curriculum to prepare students for work in interdisciplinary teams across the continuum of care. And here, um, the state colleges and other institutions offering nursing curricula in Vermont should modify curriculum where necessary to prepare students for practice across the continuum of care, including the settings where we've really, it, it, including all of the settings of care um, that this report emphasizes. Uh, we also recommend um, developing and identifying strategies to streamline the advancement through the nursing career ladder and to upskill staff. And here we recommend convening healthcare providers including hospitals, long-term care facilities, and home health agencies, and higher education programs to develop and identify needs for on-site delivery of training and education programs to upskill existing staff and to identify ways to streamline advancement through the nursing career ladder. The advisory group and this plan also recommends um, that we ensure that healthcare career education is offered to all students before leaving middle school. Here we task the agency of education with recommending a strategy to introduce all students to healthcare careers prior to leaving middle school. We also recommend advertising and recruiting for existing apprenticeship opportunities that are already available and supported by the Department of Labor. And moving now to, uh, to recommendations about regulatory changes that could facilitate uh, expanding the healthcare workforce in the state of Vermont. Um, the Office of Professional Regulation is and has been an essential partner in creating clear pathways to clinical practice for healthcare professionals. And so we, there are a number of recommendations here um, for the Office of Professional Regulation um, in this effort. The first is to advertise and promote the uniform process for endorsement as the fast track for healthcare professional licensure for all OPR regulated professions. This is a very exciting um, opportunity to collaborate with healthcare employers, as well as the Agency of Commerce and Community Development um, to include the fast track in uh, how we talk about healthcare employment opportunities in Vermont, as well as in potent the Think Vermont program. Um, the fast track for healthcare professional licensure should be widely advertised. Um, the fast track endorsement allows someone who has practiced in another state for three years to quickly be licensed in Vermont. The applicability of this avenue should be emphasized for those mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals, as well as other regulated healthcare professionals. But this is a this is a pretty um, exciting and uh, really innovative um, way to more quickly uh, bring people into working in the state of Vermont as licensed healthcare professionals. Additionally, we recommend that Canadian healthcare workers be differentiated from international healthcare workers and that Canadian, our Canadian neighbors have an ex expedited path to licensure as healthcare professionals in Vermont. Here, the OPR should evaluate the avenues in statute and rule for differentiating a path for Canadian healthcare professionals to obtain licensure in Vermont and propose these changes accordingly. In the interim, the office's interim rule, administrative rule for assessing foreign credentials does create an accessible process for licensure. Um, the OPR should create a resource on its website related to those administrative rules while the permanent uh, statute and rules are being revised. 
The Office of Professional Regulation should also consider reducing licensing barriers for telehealth practice, taking into account recommendations of the work group created by Act 21 of 2021. Uh, here, the OPR should compile and evaluate methods for facilitating the practice of healthcare professionals throughout the United States using telehealth modalities and making recommendations to the legislature. We also recommend that the OPR evaluate further opportunities to remove barriers to licensure for mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals specifically, and that uh, this review um, take place within the next five years. We also recommend um, a temporary waiver of licensure fees for first-time licensed nursing assistants. The interagency task team established um, by this recommended and to be established as a result of this report, along with the OPR, should quantify the annual revenue from first-time LNA licensure and propose an alternative funding source in lieu of the licensing fees for this group. Uh, tele telehealth is, is a vehicle um, that is essential for maximizing um, the availability of healthcare services, as well as for ensuring that workforce um, that workforce is existing in a state to meet healthcare needs. Um, there are several recommendations in terms of how telehealth can be um, further incorporated into practice so that there are more opportunities for Vermonters to receive um, healthcare through these modalities. The first recommendation is to maximize Medicare flexibility and reimbursement through the all payer ACO model agreement. Uh, AHS, along with Green Mountain Care Board, should negotiate for more flexible reimbursement policy to address service site and geographic restrictions for telehealth, including reimbursement of audio-only services that are more expansive than mental health care after the end of the federal health emergency, as well as reimbursement of more services, including telemonitoring um, and services provided in what are deemed to be urban settings, but are um, in, in Vermont, uh, I think we're hard pressed to think of any setting as, as truly urban. Uh, we, the, the plan also recommends developing commercial reimbursement models for audio only services and tasks the Department of Financial Regulation with continuing to facilitate the development of value-based prospective or capitated payment mechanisms for commercial payers for audio-only services for implementation by 2024. The report recommends expanding telehealth coverage, um, including remote patient monitoring, telemonitoring services to include diseases and conditions beyond congestive heart failure, the Department of Vermont Health Access should, re should examine emerging technologies and review associated medical literature on the clinical benefit and current best practice to determine if sufficient evidence is available to support the effectiveness of remote patient monitoring for diseases and conditions beyond congestive heart failure. And telehealth billing requirements should be clear. The Department of Financial Regulation should ensure clarity around billing requirements for, uh, com for commercial payer coverage of store and forward telemedicine and interprofessional consultations. Um, finally, the, the last recommendation related to telehealth is to explore a statewide telepsychiatry, te telepsychiatry program in emergency departments. Similar to North Carolina statewide telepsychiatry, this would could be similar to the North Carolina statewide telepsychiatry program that would help treat and divert psychiatric, psychiatric patients that seek care in emergency departments. The Department of Mental Health in collaboration with VAS should study the potential to establish and offer this statewide telepsychiatry program in Vermont emergency departments. Moving on to recruitment and reten retention, 
for um, healthcare professionals in the state of Vermont, and broadly recruitment and retention of the workforce in the state of Vermont. Many of the recommendations here are are recommendations um, that are that really do support workforce development on the whole and are inclusive of healthcare professionals um, as well. The first recommendation is to inventory and highlight state programs that support recruitment and, and retention of healthcare professionals. This is a recommendation for the interagency task team and Department of Labor. Um, the team should inventory and promote existing state programs to assist healthcare employers in recruiting and retaining staff, both temporary and permanent. For example, the Department of Labor should clearly advertise its role and availability to assist organizations that are seeking international staff members. Um, and the DOL can also promote the apprenticeship program that I spoke about earlier and can um, certainly uh, promote and, and continue its efforts to recruit current or former armed services members with healthcare training. We also recommend modifying or expanding programs that support working and living in Vermont broadly. The interagency task team should identify strategies to support workforce development and employment in Vermont, including available housing and child care for all professionals and health care workers. The task team should identify and highlight existing opportunities for health care employers, such as the Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program, and recommend to the legislature how these programs or others could be modified, expanded, or newly implemented for greater impact. Um, we also recommend creating a market cam marketing campaign to promote healthcare careers in Vermont and capitalizing on the existing incentives to live and work in Vermont and capitalizing on our overall workforce development strategies in the state. Um, this uh, marketing campaign could and, sh and should um, be aimed at recruiting uh, health care providers to Vermont as permanent residents working in the state for health care employers. And the marketing campaign should leverage regional health care employment recruitment centers and their existing networks, as well as um, resources for drawing health care workers to the state. Um, Vermont is one of the most COVID-19 vaccinated states in the nation. Um, there is a new worker relocation program in the state, and the fast track for healthcare professional licensure does uh, speed the opportunity uh, for out of state persons coming from out of state to enter uh, the healthcare workforce. We should also promote healthcare careers to new Vermonters in partnership with the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Uh, we also recommend developing a cross system. Uh, strategy to utilize um, Section 9817 of the American Rescue Plan Act, which is specifically funding available to strengthen Medicaid, home and community-based service, uh, services providers, uh, mental health and substance use disorder workforce. The Agency of Human Services should develop and implement an evidence-informed cross-system implementation strategy for the use of these funds specifically to support healthcare workforce development. Uh, we also recommend promoting wellness and peer support programs, leveraging ARPA funds here um, and appropriations to the Department of Mental Health. Um, we recommend that the Director of Trauma Prevention and Resilience Development should support efforts to address clinician burnout. And finally, uh, we recommend reducing administrative burden, cognizant that administrative burden is one of the most cited reasons um, for providers uh, that may be choosing to leave practice. The legislature should review the results of reports being submitted pursuant to Act 140 of 2020 and take further action to implement recommendations included in those reports. And finally, 
the final, uh, well, not, <laughs> not finally. There, we also have some future considerations that we outlined in this report. Um, but we, this report also recommends um, federal policy to support healthcare workforce development, and specifically related to um, traveling uh, healthcare staff agencies, um, traveling healthcare staff staffing agencies that are um, are exempt from um, providing. Ta uh, housing stipends, um, they're not taxed for per diem, such as meals and incidentals, non-tax travel reimbursement, um, specifically looking at strategies to minimize the increasing trend towards travel staffing um, that is resulting in unsustainable cost increase for healthcare employers. And this also includes anti-poaching provisions directed at travel staffing agencies, as well as price gouging uh, prohibitions directed at travel staffing agencies. As we already discussed, uh, traveling staff agencies um, are necessary for Vermont's healthcare employers um, to ensure that care is available, but the rates uh, for these staff are, um, are unsustainably high for employers in the state of Vermont. That's really the theme of this uh, report, this workforce development strategic plan is really around developing uh, the permanent and employed healthcare workforce in the state of Vermont. There are also some other um, federal policy uh, recommendations um, here um, supporting the CONNECT Act to make permanent uh, many of the federal waivers that enhance telehealth during the COVID um, public health emergency supporting the HEAT Act to eliminate the Medicare telehealth reimbursement penalty for home health agencies, the Skills Act to create um, a pipeline of workers for the long-term care sector specifically, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act to increase federal funding for long-term care, home and community-based services, the Bipartisan Healthcare Workforce Resilient Act to expedite visa authorization uh, process so that more international workers can join our workforce, uh, raising the H2B cap uh, as well so that more international workers can join the workforce. Um, and as we've recommended and um, it also recommended in the Rural Health Services Task Force report, Medicare waivers um, that would allow for um, those who are credentialed um, uh, professionals to um, be to be recognized by Medicare for reimbursement um, for services for mental health and substance use disorder treatment at parity with the way our Medicaid program recognizes these credentials for reimbursement, recognizing alcohol and drug abuse, licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors, licensed clinical mental health counselors, licensed psychologists, and licensed marriage and family counselors. Specifically, if Medicare joined with Medicaid in reimbursing uh, for these services by these licensed professionals, that would mean more availability of services um, for, for mental health substance use uh, disorder conditions. And finally, um, supporting increased funding for graduate medical education, residency and training slots to create more healthcare workers. Spencer, if you could uh, mute yourself, you're uh, getting a little bit of feedback coming through. <laughs> And finally, we um, identified some specific areas for future consideration, but that we did not task um, an entity with at this time um, in, the, in the strategic plan. Um, and this includes the current and future need and demand for dental professionals in Vermont should be reflected in, in the, uh, sorry, I'm, having trouble here, in the Vermont State Oral Health Plan and compiled by an informed group of key stakeholders, um, VDH, oral 
Office of Oral Health, the Vermont State Dental Society, the Vermont Dental Hygienist Association, Vermont Technical College, um, the Center for Technology, um, among them. And the purpose of, the, of informing the of this work group would be to inform the oral health plan to be led by VDH's Office of Oral Health um, and provide a roadmap to reduce the burden of oral diseases among Vermonters. Um, additionally, we recognize that there is uh, very much need for children uh, in need of psychiatric care, waiting for weeks in emergency departments and similar delays in discharge for older Vermonters that need psychiatric care in a long-term care setting. And future workforce discussions should include policy proposals for developing workforce, uh, developing the workforce in psychiatric care for pediatric patients and mental health care in long-term care settings. We also think there's future work to advance a coordinated approach to promote healthcare careers in K through 12 educational settings. While the report is very clear about a recommendation for middle school, we think additional work is needed to think about the entire uh, K through 12 educational experience and how that promotes uh, careers in uh, healthcare. And finally, um, considering um, future work for considering whether simulation for clinical for clinical experience could be available or more widely available for healthcare professionals. When healthcare professionals are not able to access enough hours of clinical training, um, how could simulation be an appropriate substitute? And that, that concludes the report's recommendations as well as future considerations. So um, at this point, uh, Ina, are you open for open for comments and questions? Yes. Great. So um, I'll start it off. Um, where will the buck stop, and and what's the accountability for seeing these things through, and how will progress be reported out to Vermonters? And that's it. Those are very good questions. The report is, it needs to be maintained by the Director of Healthcare Reform and the advisory group. Um, and in maintaining the report, um, I imagine that we will be following up on the tasks that are described and are um, tagged, uh, tagged throughout the recommendations. Um, the, the interagency task force is, or a task team I'm sorry, as you um, observed in the report, also has a number of responsibilities and um, will be undertaking those in coordination with other healthcare partners. And that team will be starting its work in the very near future. And when you say the very near future, what's your estimated start date? I think there's been informal work with the team already. Um, the team will come together formally, um, I would say, in uh, prior to the legislative session beginning. Okay. Um, you mentioned in your presentation the work on the uh, pipeline. And last I knew, um, you know, Mary Ann Sheehan had done a lot of work on this, but I think that uh, the funding had dried up. Is there anything to uh, get her and, and that team back on task? I I think that that's a important question and, and discussion, and I, I, I don't know that they are ne necessarily not on task. I know that um, Marianne has been doing some work in the field to survey healthcare providers regarding their vacancies um, as or and their uh, current vacancies and, and um, anticipated vacancies, I, I believe. I can't speak with authority on what Marianne um, and, the, and that particular project is doing, but I think it's really important um, that, it is a, that they are a part of the discussion. Okay, great. You know, this is uh, uh, a really exciting day to see this get, uh, you know, really started and uh, 
with that, I'll turn it over to uh, board members to uh, for comments and questions. Board members? I can go ahead. Um, Thanks, Walter. Hi, Ina. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, uh, Kevin asked one of my questions, which was going to be, what's the process for accountability? Um, I'm also wondering if when you would think um, you'd have uh, not a specific timeline, but sort of a rough timeline of short term, medium term, long term, obviously a bunch of the tasks would need to be prioritized by the interagency task team. But I wanted to get a sense of what you were thinking in terms of those next steps. Uh, in terms of the next steps of actually kind of arraying things in the short, medium, long term, or what we actually think would be more short term versus longer term work? Either or both. Um, yeah, I think that there are um, key recommendations in the report, such as, and particularly those recommendations that um, include uh, follow up with the legislature, um, that those are all. Um, depending on your definition, <laughs> short-term work. Um, I see the uh, work that needs to be done by the task team to look at the tax incentives as being near-term, short-term work. The work by the team to evaluate um, incentives for uh, current, uh, for um, uh, <laughs> permanent employment, um, that incentive opportunity to be in the near term. Uh, similarly, the work regarding our home and community based services funding um, to be in the nearer mid term um, as example. Um, longer term strategies, I think, are those that require um, a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, significant um, process through work group and collaboration um, and um, the development of, of proposals um, that may take more time and that are not necessarily bound to a legislative timeline. Thank so you. So, for instance, I, I would view, um, you know, the incorporation of, um, of or modification of curriculum um, for instance, of a longer term type of workflow where that should really be ongoing um, and a process for evaluating how curriculum should be ideally um, uh, responding to an integrated workforce. Thanks. Um, one of the areas um, I was interested in is uh, in many of our hospital budget uh, hearings, we often hear about um, different programs that the hospitals are running in order to either recruit or retain uh, staff. And of particular interest to me in the past has been a program which uh, both Brattleboro and CVMC have been very active, which is similar to what you were describing with the nursing home uh, program that was funded where the employer really nurtures their workforce through a series of um, increasing responsibility and licensing steps. So um, I was wondering if the group had talked about those programs, how you see those fitting in. It seems like it's a good, it could be a, a really good model that um, could be spread and is sort of organically spreading, but not, I would say, in a fully organized way. Um, because I would say both BMH and CVMC have shown very good results uh, with their programs, for example. Mm -hmm. We did talk about those programs and Steve Gordon was a participant in the advisory group. Um, we thought, you know, the recommendation that reflects the streamlining of the path to licensure and the uh, upskilling, we think there's more work that's necessary um, with uh, organized work group to talk about um, those sorts of opportunity or those sorts of programs and how um, to potentially scale programs of that kind. Okay, great. Um, and then um, my last question was, uh, it looks like there are some of the recommendations involve um, parties that were not 
represented on the advisory group. And I'm just wondering if you could explain how you have or will handle making sure those entities are aware of the recommendation and working with them. Yeah, um, well, that is, we, we did have participation in the advisory group from non-advisory um, members. And so some of those members um, or some of those participants um, certainly worked um, in collaboration with other advisory group members to craft recommendations um, and um, where those recommendations were made regarding um, state agencies that did not participate in the work group. Um, there was coordination behind the scenes to be sure that those state agencies understood um, where recommendations were reflected in the report. Okay. Great, and then um, that's it for questions. And my only uh, last comment would be, you may have already done this, but there was some uh, demand modeling done as part of the SIM grant um, that I think the Department of Labor, if I'm remembering correctly, was um, very much involved with. So it may just be worthwhile looking back at that because I think there were some potential lessons learned on how to approach that type of modeling. But mm -hmm. I think Matt Barowitz would probably be the the person to talk to about that. He did participate in a subcommittee um, that helped to inform the thinking around the supply and demand recommendation. Great. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Who would like to go next? I'll jump in. Um, I, I want to build a little bit on um, uh, you know Kev <coughs> Kevin's question and. Um, and Robbins, in, in terms of, of of us having a view going forward, um, I did do a little word search of your 26-page report, and in that report there are five five shells. Four of them are in Act 155, so most of the shells apply to you, Ina. Um, and um, but there are 73 shoulds, um, and that uh, and that's. 73 shoulds across a broad array of state government. And so I, I do think in terms of, 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 well, first I think that the work you, you've done is extraordinary, you and, and the team. I mean, it's uh, um, my, for one of my first introductions when I came on the board was at a, a meeting in Castleton, which I think Kevin shared, you know, where the person uh, got up in front of the audience and said there were somewhere down the road going to be night, we're going to be short, I think it was like 1900 nurses. And here we are um, down the road, and we are also compounded, you know, by the pandemic. So um, you've done uh, a very important job here, and a very good job of kind of, you know, having all the marbles at least on the table. Um, but I, I do worry that in government things can get lost, and um, so the sooner we can have a timeline, so that for each of your what you call actions required. You know, we know who's responsible and and when they're required to have it done. So it allows um, participants to um, have that peer pressure on the process. You know, to 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 keep it moving down the road. Um, and also, who might if it's not moving down the road at the pace that people want or expect. You know, who is the enforcer here? Um, I mean, sometimes, as you know, in state government, you need somebody to make it happen um, and to break break log jams and um, I that's got to fall to somebody as opposed to a task force I, I would think um, one question I have is um, I have the uh, closeout report for divas budget you know for 2021 um, the 52 points of light uh, you're probably familiar with those and um, so they ended fiscal year 2021 with um, uh, and over or un unspent funds of $16 million. Um, and uh, that's not a lot of money in Divas land, but it's still a lot of money. And I'm just wondering if in your process, uh, um, whether you will start to go kind of comb through state government to escrow, try to escrow funds um, and not have departments spend them that can go to uh, the purposes that you've outlined in, 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 in your strategic report here, because um, money, you know, can be set aside and 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 be available to su support some of those things. Like 
I know that the 16 million part of that is global commitment is probably not eligible, but a good chunk of that money is general fund or state dollars. And um, so when I look at some of the numbers associated, uh, like for example, the, um, the, uh, the travelers uh, money, um, uh, you know, I, I it, it, it's the, this, these kinds of numbers are of a scale that if, if they can be escrowed, um, if you can have someone maybe from finance or management or just kind of looking through government to say, hey, look, we don't need it today. We don't need it six months from now, but we're going to need it um, to do that. I'm also curious as to, uh, I call it the TIF for nurses, the tax incentive uh, program and property taxes, but this, that the legislature um, twice rejected that. And But I, I don't understand why they would do that because uh, you're you're getting in the future tax dollars from an employee that you might not have if you didn't provide the incentive. Um, it's the TIF concept, and so what what is the what is the resistance in the legislature to that? I I don't want to um, you know I don't want to represent the the legislature and uh, but. I think that there was some. Um, I think that there were some concerns about um, lost revenue, but as you just said, the revenue um, does not exist if the individual is not working in the state of Vermont. Um, I think um, there may have also been uh, concerns um, that the the program was too narrow in um, only providing the incentive for graduates of Vermont um, colleges and wanting to see that those incentives perhaps be extended beyond, um, particularly because we do have limits on how many we can educate in the state of Vermont. And I think that um, that is, you know, the spirit of this recommendation and what the um, team will take on is really um, a, a review of what types of opportunities and tax incentives um, could be pursued and perhaps um, exploring, you know, revisiting models in other states and what those look like uh, in order to propose um, something uh, to propose a, a new model. And if I could follow up on that, Tom, um, I, I think you, you hit it on the head with the fact that um, you're creating uh, a new base, and sometimes when you expand your revenues, you don't get to see the dollars immediately, but over time, it could have a significant impact. And what I've heard from legislators is that just as there are those who don't believe that TIF works, that it only goes to those projects that would have gotten it anyways, there's some concern about whether or not it goes to people who would have been working in, in Vermont, regardless of whether or not there was that tax incentive. But even um, harder on legislators is trying to sell it to their constituents who often um, are really complaining about the fact that, um, listen, why are you giving it to a tax incentive to somebody new when I've been here paying taxes all along and what are you doing for me? So it, it seems like it's it's a no-brainer, but there seems to be a lot of resistance on on some fronts. And uh, so it, it, it's never an easy sell no matter what the proposal is. But, but you're right. This is a way to, you know, these are good paying jobs. And this is a way to create uh, a base, not only for tax revenue, but also for people who end up being volunteers in the community, serving on local boards. Um, it, it really is something that uh, can make a huge difference. So let's hope that uh, we see some progress. Well, I, I know that that's the same issue with TIF and um, uh, there's probably some merit to that. I mean, no program is perfect, but on this one, um, you know, it's also Vermonters that might decide to go into a career you know, because uh, of this tax tax advantage, and uh, uh, it just it uh, you know I'm sure there will you know there will there will be some leakage, but uh, I think the overall gain is bigger than 
any any leak which leakage that might occur. Um, I have just a couple other quick ones. Um, so w you know that the legislature uh, tasks uh, uh, um, folks to take a look at the benchmark plan for the QHP population, and that that legislation basically has two parts to it. One is just to make sure that the benchmark plan is aligned with our population health goals. And then the other is about adding, I think, five or six different benefits. And so I'm just wondering as we go down the road, because that report is due, I think, in January, is is, is the, 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 the demand for attention and for resources that are outlined in in your strategic plan, are they in any way in conflict with um, uh, you know the the kind of view of the benchmark plan. I, I can't see them being in conflict with taking existing resources and making sure they're as well aligned as possible with their population health goals. But I can see uh, a conflict between expanding benefits at a time when we're trying to um, uh, stabilize the the existing infrastructure. Does that make any sense to you? Um. I, I'm, I think I might need some clarification on your question, Tom, because were you, were you asking about the resources and staff time available on those two projects, or you're talking about, um, you're talking about, no, I'm not I was, sure. I, I was talking I, about benefits. Uh, staff time, I don't think, it, I mean, that's a one time, but um, I, I'm thinking about some of these benefits that the legislature wanted looked at. They're expensive. I think they're they're expensive. I, so I think that they, you know, I don't, I don't see that those things are in conflict um, at this time, particularly without, you know, the recommendations and the, and the thinking um, uh, from that EHB work group. You know, I, I don't see a conflict at this time. No. no. And Thank so you. my, my uh, last, this is more an observation, is that um, I know that you have uh, ACC um, uh, communities and development kind of overseeing this, the housing uh, challenges that you put before them. But I would advise that having been a former housing commission, a lot of resources aren't at the agency level. They're over um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and VHFA. And so you just wanna might make sure that those folks are engaged in your housing efforts because that that's where the money is to do what you wanna do. Thank you. We certainly imagine that the task team will have to be working really collaboratively and cooperatively with other partners, um, but did want to assign some accountability for particular state agencies. But that's a really good recommendation and thank you. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. This You've, you've done a great job as I read through this. It was um, a very comprehensive overview, but when I did the, the tally of shells and shoulds, it, it gets a little scary. So uh, may the force be with you. <laughs> okay, Jess. Sure. So I will also extend my thanks to you, Ina. I know the hard work here for the, you and the entire advisory group here putting this together. It's very comprehensive. Um, I'm glad others raised the accountability issue because I think that's really important. So this is not just a report that gets, you know, put on the back burner somewhere and is not revisited. Um, but let me ask you another question as I'm thinking about how you prioritize the recommendations and how we start to think about, you know, how we should allocate scarce resources. In my mind, I think about, okay, if I were to think about the recommendations in here, I'd wanna have a matrix, which is like high and low impact and high and low feasibility so that the resources were being dedicated first and foremost to the high impact, high feasibility recommendations. Um, and I, part of me, when I was reading through it, I was thinking about, well, I can't really discern what the impact of some of these recommendations are because I don't have a sense, and, and this may be more a task for the interagency task team, but thinking about, you know, how do we evaluate what's the data on the effectiveness of some of these recommendations? And, I, and I'll give an example of, do we park money in the scholarships or do we park money in loan repayment, which has a, has a bigger impact on re recruitment and retention of healthcare? And I, and I, um, 
you know, and maybe that data already exists to do that evaluation, right? You know, is there data already out there that tracks how long recipients of scholarships stay in the state versus how long recipients of loan repayment uh, stay in the state? Or how do we start to think about that? So I guess what I would just ask is how how we can start to um, compartmentalize or identify the high impact, high vis feasibility initiatives and where those resources are going to come from. Also, I guess is the second question, but I, you know, I, I thank you for your question. We, as a work group, in fact, created a kind of rubric to and criteria for these recommendations, and that you know that was really created um, pretty early on in our work together to really consider like what's feasible, um, what has it, it, what has a significant impact. Um, and we agreed on, I don't have them in front of me, but I think a set of five criteria. And because of the, I think because of the breadth of the issue and the different um, the different entry points to get at this issue stemming from the very near term, how do we ensure that, um, you know, uh, uh, for, like for instance, if I'm a healthcare employer, I'm gonna be thinking about how do I ensure that I can renew that contract with the travel agency as, as a for instance, or if I'm trying um, to bring on traveling staff and I have nowhere to house them or there's no identified housing, that's extremely near term. But of equal importance is the fact that we're not educating and growing our own healthcare workforce, enough of our own healthcare workforce in the state. And so we had to balance as a work group those very long term type of strategies to improve that, that or bolster the education system. And so I think that that was a challenge for us and kind of just. In, in this variety of recommendations that really span um, different approaches. And I think also um, some of the evaluation about the you know dollar impact, for instance, it's something we talked about quite a bit in the advisory group. And it was difficult for us to evaluate the impact without having done the work to assess the program. And that's where a lot of these recommendations, they really are recommendations for a body of work to occur that we weren't able to accomplish in our time meeting together. So the recommendations are getting work started on evaluating um, the opportunities for the loan program, for instance, um, and where and what types of new professionals, professional types might be better, might be advantaged by being able to participate in a program like that. But I, I, I it's, I, I feel um, that I absolutely understand wanting to matrix um, the recommendations in that way. And, and certainly I think the advisory group does too, but we didn't feel fully prepared to um, be able to assess the recommendations using that kind of criteria without them being mature in some senses. I think we acknowledge that not all of these recommendations are, are mature. There's a lot of work that has to happen here. Um, the report describes a lot of ongoing work. Which Is that I something then that could be a part of the task of the interagency task group to make sure that they're you know, thinking about feasibility, but also impact in the way in which they're prioritizing um, the, you know, the, their final recommendations or work yeah. stream that comes out of it. I think it's a really great recommendation and we should really carry through the criteria that we developed um, because we did as a group agree to, um, I believe five, five criteria, maybe fewer, maybe three, <laughs> it was, um, but I think we could carry those through. Yeah. Um, just a, a quick question about the National Health Service Corps additional funding and those applications being funded in areas that have lower um, HPSA scores, those health professional service area scores. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about which areas in Vermont might be impacted, if at all. I, and by how much? I mean, is this going to be something that we're going to be able to benefit from, really? Uh, yes, I believe it's it's a lim time limited. 
But whereas in, in the past, um, we were not really able to benefit because we weren't scoring low enough. Basically, there are enough new dollars that are being infused that there are going to be more eligible people. Yes. The, okay, I so we're going to score low enough now, be, or, or the dollars are going to be high enough to be spread farther? Is that it, more? It, it, the dollars are higher to be spread further. I don't think our score changes. Um, okay. It's going to be more dollars. But that's where um, a colleague on the on the advisory group would, if you wanted to learn more about that, um, uh, uh, Stephanie Pagiluka from the by from by state primary care um, would was the participant that really helped to educate me about that program. Um, I think that would be something certainly we can follow up with you on. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I just wasn't sure if our scores had fallen perhaps because of the workforce shortages that we're experiencing or the dollars were, you know, I just, but that's helpful. Any follow-up would be great. I believe it's the dollars. It's really gotten an infusion of dollars. Okay. Um, and just one more final, uh, this is very, very, very low hanging fruit, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, and this, my data, my data might be old, but I think OPR, when they collect the licensing data, um, it would be really helpful if this is not currently in the in their data collection is to understand whether the the licensed providers are active or not active and if they're full time or part time, because I think from a few years ago when we tried to access this information, um, it was not clear whether or not everybody on there was they had their license but they may not have been actively um, practicing. And furthermore, they you know it would be helpful to know if they're full time or part time. If you're trying to use that kind of data to assess supply of providers, and you have a long list of providers, but some of them are retired but keeping their licenses active, but they're not actually practicing, it's not really a true FTE. Um, so I, I wondered if that might be something very very low hanging fruit. But if that data collection could more accurately reflect you know, who is truly actively practicing in the state. And especially as we are facing a increasing retirement of providers, there's going to be more that may maintain their license for a few years as they, you know, go into retirement, but they're not really actively practicing. So my information might be outdated. It was from a few years ago, but something to look into. But thank you, Ina, very, very helpful. Thanks, Jess. Um you know, we know that Governor Scott's uh, committed to uh, the implementation of uh, your report, um, but we also know that governors don't uh, stay on forever. And um, this is also what we know is that a lot of things in this report don't happen overnight. It's going to take a lot of years of hard work. And I'm just curious if you're going to go to the legislature and try to get something in the books where there's a commitment by the state of Vermont, because we all know that priorities can change from administration to administration. Um, do you have any plans to try to uh, make sure that there's a long-term commitment? To implementing the plan specifically? Yes. The advisor group didn't discuss um, that. Uh, that, you know, idea specifically, you know, the legislation does say that the director of health care reform is responsible for maintaining the plan. And so in that sense, um, we do have now a current and up to date plan. Um, and that position, um, you know, I believe has some accountability there for maintaining the plan already in Act 155 of 2020 and in doing so with the uh, advisory group. You know, I know that you're uh, incredibly talented and can do so many things, but I worry that um, if the sole responsibility for getting this done is on your shoulders, that maybe we're being, you're, we're asking you to be able to do too much. And that's one of the fears that I have because you're asked to do much more than just this report. And so. <laughs> and that really is, you know, uh, it, not not me and my in my role as, as an individual, but the advisory group certainly thinking about um, the recommendation for the um, task team. And I and I understand that a team doesn't feel it feels like the accountability is too dis diffuse among the team members. But um, 
there really does have to be accountability that spans state government for this type of work because it is it is larger than any one agency. It's certainly larger than an individual and an individual position. And so that's really the part of the spirit of the task team um, being that entity which steers a lot of this work. The other piece is um, I think we've seen just outstanding inter agency and department collaboration in COVID to, to confront COVID-19 that has been incredibly efficient, effective, um, creative, and um, that really, you know, partners have moved some pretty big mountains together in order to address COVID-19. Um, and that's that's been inter, like I said, interagency and interdepartment. And we were really viewing that as a model for this work, recognizing um, the current crisis in workforce, which is true across the entire state um, and in all and sectors, uh, not isolated to healthcare, although particularly acute in healthcare at this time. And that's really the spirit behind um, that recommendation and the inter the the interdepartment interagency accountability. You know, one of the things that jumps out at me is that um, just as the Green Mountain Care Board is working on sustainability for hospitals, um, we know that we've had a problem in Vermont with sustainability for our higher ed system, and specifically our state colleges. And it seems like we have an opportunity, if this is done right, to um, create better sustainability for our state colleges, because if we can expand the nursing programs, we know that there's a pool of applicants that, that uh, wish to go. If we can expand the tech programs, if we can expand the, the dental hygienist programs, if we can, um, that helps create the pool that makes our state college system sustainable. And also part of the plan um, talks about creating a physician's assistance program at the state college system. And not only would that help um, the sustainability issue for the state colleges, but right now we rely, um, we're very, very dependent on UVM to create all our providers. And if we can have a secondary source for some providers, I think it's um, so essential to uh, any type of uh, plan that works over the long run. So I, I think that there's huge opportunities here. Do, Tom talked about you know trying to earmark dollars uh, across state government. There's a lot of relief funds that haven't been spent yet. Is there any effort to try to make sure that they get allocated towards doing some of this work? I think when we recommend that the task team evaluate funding opportunities, I think I, you know, we're really looking to the expertise that lies there to understand what funding uh, may, or may, may be available for um, some of these initiatives. You know, I don't think anybody's going to uh, argue that this report needs to be um, carried out and everybody should be supportive of this report. The, the real tough thing is getting those resources and making sure that it happens. And, uh, um, you know, we just are all gonna have to work together to make sure that happens. So with that, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Um, does any member of the public wish to offer public comment? on the um, Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan. And also I just want to, before I call on the, the first person to remind what Susan said that uh, we do have an open public comment period. And Susan, um, when are we scheduled to uh, vote on, on the plan? Let me check, one moment okay. please. While you're checking, um, I'm going to start uh, going to uh, the public. The first hand that I see raised is Jeff Tiemann, and on deck will be Susan Aronoff. Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now that I figured out how to get my camera on. Um, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Jeff Tiemann, CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals. Um, I just want to make a couple quick comments, um, starting by thanking Ina 
and the department for the work that's involved in developing this strategic plan, um, being so thoughtful and complete in, in working to understand the nature of the workforce challenge and suggest the right set of solutions. I also just want to say that um, couldn't agree more with Ina that um, Vermont government um, entities have moved some big mountains together, and that includes along with the provider community. So I'm really grateful to Ina and AHS and VDH for working so collaboratively through us, um, with us through some of the really tough moments of the past 22 months. Um, the hospital association, as, as Kevin just said, really hard not to support these things. And we certainly support the slate of recommendations being put forward because the workforce shortage and its consequence um, its consequences are really the greatest challenge that hospitals face, along with the broader field of healthcare providers. I do want to underline that it's important, I think, to look broadly at economic development, including ways to attract business, create housing, enhance childcare, and build up communities, work that really needs to be par a prominent part of this so that if we do welcome people to Vermont, we can support them with the right infrastructure. Um, as we're seeing really play out right now, workforce sits at the core of all the problems or many of the problems we have in healthcare right now and in hospitals, whether that's responding to COVID and vaccinating Vermonters, staffing EDs, or making sure there are enough people to prepare food and maintain facilities. Um, the, the access issues we face across the state are uh, at least uh, in part due to insufficient workforce. So with more physicians and nurses and specialists and other caregivers and other professionals, we could help ensure that Vermonters get the best possible care at the right place at the right time. Um, finally, just want to say that with hospitals so extremely busy right now, um, they continue to treat not only COVID patients, but a broad range of others who have delayed care during the pandemic, have come in extremely sick, require mental health treatment, or are waiting for a long-term care bed. And this higher acuity further stretches all levels of workforce, which means that people can be tasked with more responsibility and more work hours. So the, the workforce issue would really help ease this capacity crunch, maybe not solve it, um, but certainly help us through the current situation we face. So really glad this work is taking place. We will be involved as VAS um, in every way we can and hope to see some real progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'm gonna call on Susan Aronoff and on deck will be Dale Hackett. Susan. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, you know, that was awesome. Um, the report's fantastic. Um, I want to speak about the home and community based workforce and, in particular, some of the Medicaid funded workforce and the services that the state, that the Agency of Human Services actually purchases and therefore can play a great role in um, increasing the wage so that the people who work for the designated agencies and specialized services agencies and provide services to people with disabilities can have a living wage. So I'd like to see more in the report about the home and community-based workforce. I know there's a mention that you're gonna look into using some of the um, increased FMAP money specifically for the home and community-based workforce to have like an evidence-based study but I don't really think it's as complicated all, as all that. I think we all know that it's a workforce that just hasn't kept up with inflation, doesn't get pay raises, has so many vacancies. Um, and if that workforce were more sustainable, if people were able to get the mental health services um, at home, in the schools, if people were able to get um, services provided by the non-licensed professionals, and I'm going to talk about those in a second, um, that that those dollars fund, I think there would be, you know, some of the backup at the ERs, et cetera, would be alleviated. So please consider adding more in the report about the home and community-based workforce, the Medicaid-funded workforce, and the immediate things that uh, the levers at hand, at AHS's hands to increase um, the rates of pay and make some of the pay raises, um, you know, permanent on an ongoing basis. Every other workforce gets a pay raise every year. The hospital budgets go up every year. Insurance rates go up every year. Um, we've got a fight every year anew, like it's Groundhog Day all over again to get a one, two or 3% pay raise for the designated agency and specialized services agency. Another group I'd really talk like to talk about is please connect with the Governor's Commission on the Employment of People with Disabilities. The good news is in Vermont, 50% of people with disabilities who want to work are working. The bad news in Vermont 
that 50% of people with disabilities who want to work are not working. There's a lot of opportunity in Medicaid and elsewhere to pay for peer provided services. And we could put a lot of people to work helping other, helping their peers, um, especially in the developmental disability field and in the um, psychiatric survivor world. There are people who would prefer to get their services from a peer and we could put peers to work. And I'd really like to see something about peer employment in there as well. And I'd be happy to connect with you offline about things people are doing in other states with their FMAP dollars to employ um, people with disabilities. It's something you could do to come into compliance with the home and community-based conflict of interest rules. Specifically, it's a mitigating strategy to have um, peer provided services. Yes. I'd love to add to that. Oh, sounds like I might have upset, upset someone. Anyway, thank you for the time. <laughs> and uh, great to see you all. Thank you, Susan. So next I'm going wait, to call- Wait, one last thing, one last thing, I'm sorry. One thing that you had in there, and those of you who have heard me since I was on the SIM grant talk about this, you added finally something about getting um, the same, um, getting Medicare to pay for the same uh, clinicians that Medicaid pays for, that too, would help our designated and specialized services agency. If they could bear, bill Medicare for the services provided um, by the same ranked clinicians to everyone you know, 65 and older, then our DAs and SSAs would have a whole new funding stream. So thank you for that. Okay, so next I'm gonna call, call on Dale Hackett and Walter Carpenter will be on deck. Dale? I gotta, I gotta respond a little bit to what Susan said. With an aging, aging population and a state as old as Vermont is, you're killing yourself if you're not involving Medicare in any funding stream. Um, good point, Susan. Well done, the, a very good report, but I have to ask you a question because as I read the reports, and I mean reports, I've, I've read many things, I'm always, by the time I get done, feeling like something is missing, like we didn't catch every major factor. You are working with all this information. I assume you work with, when they have the meetings, you're there, um, or you're getting reports on them. Um, what, what do you get a sense of that's missing? that you would call a really significant factor, variable? I, I think the question makes sense because when you're in a place to get all the information, you can see things that others can't see. And as I've read the report, I've got the feeling like it's a book that when you finish the story, it feels like the story was incomplete. So, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but do you have any response? I think you're right that um, in spite of of all of, you know, kind of the iterative discussions that we had as an advisory group over quite a number of months, um, that there is something that is likely um, missing here. Um, I, what I would hope, though, is that um, through the structures that we'll put in place, um, the advisory group being a permanent subcommittee of the statewide workforce development board, um, as well as the task team, which will begin its work uh, in very short order, to um, carry out these recommendations for which it is specifically accountable, that, that those new structures will be a place for um, the missing information, if you will, to land, um, that we will have people actively working in this area, um, creating uh, solutions um, to what we know to be this broad statewide crisis. Um, I, I, I hope in some ways that um, that there are some things that we have that we have missed that are better ideas than what we have because I think I think we certainly um, 
we certainly recognize um, that people are 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 working very hard. Healthcare providers, specifically, um, are working very hard um, in during with some trying conditions. Um, and um, I guess what I'm saying is. Um, I naively hope that maybe there's like one silver bullet out there that we missed, but I, I don't think that that's the case. But I do hope that these structures that we create are a real landing place um, for whatever might might have been missing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dale. Next, we're gonna go to uh, Walter Carpenter. And thank you, Walter, for those uh, pictures of, uh, I guess it was the reservoir. Um, yep with some uh, great foliage. So go ahead. That's my workspace, Kevin. It's a beautiful Look place to work. It's not all romance, but it is gorgeous. Uh, just a couple questions. I think I want to build off of what Susan said and then what Tom had said, as well as what Dale has said. So I guess three tiers here, hopefully in one question. I may have missed it, but one of the things that I did not hear, and Tom may have covered it and I may have missed it, is pay benefits like vision, healthcare, retirement, um, equitable, equitable pay, as well as how to ensure staffing levels. Um, I didn't hear that in Ina's report. I don't know if I missed it, but I know pay is a just from talking to nurses and doctors who come to my workspace, which many of them do, that pay is a huge problem. And I'm just reading a public comment. Um, who is it by here? Deb Snell, uh, Vermont nurses, <clears throat> president of Vermont nurses there with UVM, Federation of Nurses and Health. And it's about pay and benefits and measly 2% rate increases, and in burnout, the burnout this causes. So I'm wondering, has that part of it been addressed? Or is it just left to the individual hospitals uh, and practices to deal with? Or is there gonna be a standard to, some kind of minimum standard at least on this, or, or what? Um, because I think that's part of the huge problem. And that so many hospitals, for instance, try to, you know, they're, they're so short staffed because of a lot of these issues that if they need 10 people on a floor, for example, to pick a random example, and they only have five, they'll try to do the same work as they do with 10. And as a patient, I've had direct experience with this. So I had a nurse fall asleep on my arm one time. And I just looked over and her head was, you know, her hair was down. I woke her up. She was so exhausted that I offered her the gurney that I was on. So I keep, I keep going back to that. And I think that was the missing piece Dale was talking about and the benefit that Tom was talking about, and definitely what Susan was talking about. So how's that not to connect anything? But that's, you know, I think that's, that's a huge, huge issue, and I didn't see that in the report. Well, I think that uh, most hospitals today realize that um, it's gonna cost them money. And um, what I hear from nurses, Walter, isn't as much complaints about the compensation or the benefits, but it's complaints about um, the understaffing. It's the complaints about um, they wanna give great patient care. And in today's environment, with not having enough colleagues working with them. It's very difficult to deliver the type of care that you want to deliver. Um, 
most nurses enter the profession because they want to go home at the end of the day and, and know that they've done something good for um, their fellow humans. And um, too often now they go home and they worry about what didn't they do because they were so overworked and uh, taxed on that. And uh, But you're right, pay is an issue. Um, but... I, th I think that uh, if you look at it, um, I don't think that any hospital is trying to say we don't need to try to pay our, our uh, staff as much as possible at this point in time. What really is uh, tough is that everything slides downhill and who's often left behind are the skilled nursing facilities who can't compete with the larger organizations. And that's our most vulnerable part of the public. And I worry about them more than anybody. I think that's the problem of the way we treat healthcare overall, which is rather as a business than as a public good. But that's not the issue here. I would just, you know, I hear the pay issue, the understaffing issue all the time as well. I hear that all the time you know and a lot of them just come to my park and just lay there just half done because they're trying to get over it and this was before the pandemic the pandemic of course has added to all of this but that is one thing you know the and why people are leaving vermont is they can't keep up and people are coming to vermont too oh it's I a know. national I meet them. problem it's very much a national problem. There's a lot of frustration out there. There's been a, a term coined for what has happened, and it's called the Great Resignation. And a lot of it yeah. uh, is people our age who just have said, enough is enough. I don't need to keep working. I can survive. And um, that's unfortunate um, that they're under such stress that they don't want to continue to whatever they originally had thought would be their retirement date. It's not only happening in the hospitals or in that in the yep. medical field, it's happening in the tourist field as well. And there's a definite reason for that is so many workers <laughs> and in both areas are simply treated as migratory workers, basically like nothing. And that's the big issue. I don't know an industry out there today that doesn't have workforce challenges. The The only difference I would say here is that in healthcare, um, it could become a matter of life and death. And yeah. also it's a situation where um, we're gonna pay whether we, we acknowledge it or not, because we're gonna end up paying for travelers at at least probably right now today, three times what it would cost for you know, um, a working Vermonter. So, you know, that's why this this report is so important. It doesn't matter um, if you believe in single payer, if you believe that government doesn't have a role. However we deliver healthcare, we need people that are gonna do that delivery. And that's really what this is about. And I, I can't say it often enough that the only way that we're going to be successful is when we grow our own supply, because this is a national and becoming a worldwide problem. And so if we don't, in our own educational system, create a pipeline of new professionals, we're not going to, we're not going to succeed. Well, that I agree with. Yep. Chair Mellon, this is Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Did you so, push off public comment? <laughs> well, whenever anyone says what Susan said, and I said, oh, and that was Susan Aronoff. We have great first names, Susan. Um, no, I just wanted to answer your question about when we have to approve this report. So the, the legislation so says I in, is that uh, uh, we have an open public comment period through yep. November 1st and our uh, hope is to vote on this on November 3rd, that the legislation says that we have 30 days upon receipt. 
I believe receipt was October 15th, but I could be wrong. Yep, that's correct. So um, the, the goal will be to uh, vote on this on November 3rd, um, but a lot will depend on uh, what we receive for public comment. And so um, I strongly encourage anyone that has public comment and suggested uh, changes to this report to um, get them um, to our public comment portal and we'll immediately forward them to uh, Ina. And uh, with the hope that, um, I mean, you could nitpick a lot of things, but nobody could say that there isn't an incredible amount of work that went into this report in a collaborative manner. Um, and so I, I think, you know, again, I can't uh, thank Ina enough for all the work that she and the, the people responsible for this report have uh, performed for the state of Vermont. Is there any other public comment? Is there any other public comment? Hearing none, I wish to thank you, Ina. And uh, you've heard our timeline. And uh, hopefully uh, um, we will adhere to that. Next on the agenda, I'm going to um, turn to Russ McCracken. And we're going back to the um, 2022 budget guidance and reporting requirements for Medicare only non-certified accountable care organizations. We began this conversation um, a week ago and um, well, even before that, much before that, but um, we're coming back to it. And uh, Russ, if you could tee this up for us, mm -hmm. it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, board members. I will share my screen here. Let me know if you can see my screen. We can. Great, thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, this is a continuation of the discussion from last week. Um, I wanted to uh, first um, talk to public comments. I, uh, after these slides were posted this morning, we, we did actually get um, an additional public comment uh, from Clover Health. Um, that, I saw come in um, earlier during this meeting. Um, they they thank the board for the time in developing this guidance, but um, say that uh, in their view, it remains overly burdensome for ACOs with a small footprint in Vermont. And they encourage the board um, in particular to consider an exception, um, an exception from this guidance for ACOs with a small footprint in Vermont. And that's one of the um, items that I will uh, have flagged for uh, further discussion here. Um, I summarized the the um, comments from the meeting from Clover Health last week uh, re regarding standards for approving the ACO's budget, tying the reporting obligations to state health care goals, um, addressing the budget review timeline, um, and adding the exemption. And so I want to flag, uh, I think, a couple of points for further discussion. Um, though I think most of this would center around the question of an exemption for smaller uh, ACOs with a smaller footprint. Um, the first one is just a note that uh, in response to board member Pelham's comment last week, we, I will update the guidance adding a reference to um, the second statutory provision uh, regarding the verification under oath. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think that's a uh, uh, contentious or, or controversial at all. Um, I want to discuss adding a question to the guidance um, that's asking the ACOs to report their expected payments to providers um, based on. Uh, the FPP categories um, that are presented in the uh, HCPLAN um, uh, ACO uh, framework report that um, you may be familiar with. It, it breaks FPP 
into four different categories. And um, so we'd ask a question to the ACOs to, to do the same as they report their um, payment to providers. Uh, second point is um, an exemption from the guidance and reporting, uh, specifically for the Medicare only ACOs with a presence in Vermont of fewer than a threshold number of providers and or a threshold number of attributed lives. Uh, Clover asked the board to consider exempting any ACO with uh, 30 or fewer participating providers or 2,500 attributed beneficiaries in the state. Um, for some context, I, when Clover presented, they said um, they have uh, 20, 20 providers. Uh, it's one practice, but it's 20 providers in the state and approximately 2,000 attributed lives. Um, the a uh, healthcare advocate is going to offer a uh, public comment um, in opposition to any exemption uh, from this guidance for, for smaller ACOs. Um, I, I think it's worth, uh, I think the board um, should consider an exemption here, um, you know, considering that these are uh, ACO is regulated by CMS. They're participating in a Medicare model. Um, so the incremental patient or patient protection that the board is providing here, um, and also the concerns around alignment with uh, the broader health care with broader health care goals in the state um, are less significant when you get to a smaller group. And I, I think it potentially becomes disproportionate um, in terms of the amount of recording reporting required of the ACO and the work of the board to um, really look through and evaluate everything that the ACO submits. Uh, so um, that it, I think is a point worth, worth discussing. <clears throat> um, and then the last one here is uh, the annual reporting and review timeline. Um, this is a point that I actually don't think needs to be resolved for the 2022 guidance. The 2022 guidance could be done off cycle in the sense that um, once the board approves the guidance, we it could ask ACOs to submit, as there's only one affected ACO by, by this guidance, ask the ACO to submit um, information, um, say by the end of the year, for a review and a hearing in in January, which was the tentative timeline that I had I'd set out in the draft. And then for 2023 and future years, we could the board could revisit this question of whether um, this uh, annual process should be done in alignment with the um, review and approval of one care or whether it should be done over the summer <clears throat> to kind of align with when the ACO finalizes its provider list with CMS. Um, so I, I will, uh, those were the four points I really wanted to set up for discussion, or really three points for discussion. Um, uh, so I will, I will stop there. Thank you, Russ. Um, I guess I can start off the uh, conversation by saying that uh, um, as busy as we are in the summertime, I do think that uh, that might be the right time to uh, um, be doing it and lining it up with uh, the attribution of the providers. Um, not that I want to uh, add any additional work to the summer, but I do think that 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 could make sense. As far as um, uh, an exemption, um, I, I'm very curious to hear what the healthcare advocate has to say, 
but if it was um, a small enough number, um, I think I could support um, some type of uh, um, exemption, um, especially when it came to, um, for example, if it was a few Vermonters affected by cross-border um, work, things like that. Uh, discuss adding question for ACEO to report their expected payments to providers based on the LAN categories. Um, you know, I, I'd want to make sure that it's not an incredible uh, burden, but it, it seems to make sense. And uh, as far as referencing 18 VSA, um, uh, I, I don't think there's any argument there. So I guess I've started it off. Other board members? I would, I would just say to the second bullet that, um, you know, uh, and referencing the draft guidelines that uh, um, fixed payments in the draft guidelines are mentioned three times. Um, but I, you know, but as I've, we went through the hospital budgets and others, there are all flavors of fixed payments, and some are even as um, the um, the budget guy from UVM stated, some are either you know, and I'm, I'm not saying I agree with them, but his point was there they have a negative impact because the administrative cost of following them and the uh, uh, risk of, of not knowing what your actual settlements are going to be is, is, is problematic. So to me, um, the standard is, the, 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 the highest standard is, is a capitated payment. Um, and that's where it's just disconnected from fee-for-service. And um, but the way that the guideline was drafted, um, that's that's not the way it was aggregated. So it, it just seems to me we, you know, um, and I'm making this up a little bit as I go along, but that land category made sense to me, you know, that there's four categories. And um, if you're got a lot of your payments uh, in the fourth category, you know, you are well aligned with where we're trying to go. If you have a lot of payments in the first category, you you could be a negative force to where we want to go. So I'm I'm just you know seeking to find have the guidelines give us some clarity as to what kind of fixed payments we're talking about. How are you on the other uh, points of discussion, Tom? Well, the first one, the the note one uh, was fine. Um, I, the only thing about these small ACOs is I just wonder if there's a lot of small ACOs is the administ and and therefore there's a loss of economies of scale. Is there um, uh, do a lot of smaller ACOs add up to higher administrative costs? Uh, but that's a conceptual issue, um, uh, not one that I I have any insight about. So I'm 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 open on you know to hear from others. What about the timeline? Um, <laughs> uh, bring it on. You know I don't know what to say about timelines. It just uh, it's it's never ending except for a few weeks here and there. So okay, who would like to go next, Robin or Jess? I'm happy to, or unless you prefer to, Jess. Jess always likes to go last. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Um, so I, I see the note as a technical change, uh, which makes sense. Um, I'm fine with the land categories, although I think some of the land categories are really uh, designed more around the payer ACO level than the ACO provider. So. Uh, but I assume staff will sort that out. Um, on the timeline, I'm as Russ said, I don't think that's a I don't think we need to make a final decision with on that at this point because I think it really would apply to 2023, given where we are in the cycle. So I'm open to it. Um, 
in terms of what made sense, I think the reason why we had normally pushed it till after the provider list is because it's difficult to provide the data until you know your provider list. So I think we'd need to explore whether we'd be able to get good projections prior to the provider list. But I'm open to it um, for sure. And um, on the exemption, um, I would say I could probably be talked into a very small exemption, but overall, um, I'd rather not have an exemption. OK, thank you, Robin. Just I guess I am last. Um, OK, so I am fine with one. I think, you know, with the um, reference to BSA 9374, um, I am also fine with number two. I think that perhaps I, I agree with Robin that the staff might be able to think about what those, you know, LAN categories are and, and make it more appropriate to this. But in, in the spirit of trying to understand the fixed perspective payments and where they, uh, what types they are, I, I appreciate that and I think that's relevant. Um, the timeline, I'm with everybody else and that, you know, seems like we're busy all year round. I think, you know, if this is, if that makes more sense, um, I'm fine with that. Um, with the exemption, I, I too want to hear what the healthcare advocate has to say. Um, I appreciate the desire to allow innovation and, uh, you know, experiment with small uh, pilots in the state. Uh, so we can learn from them and not want to create such a regulatory burden that none of that innovation happens. Um, so I, I'm open to the idea of a, of a very small floor, I suppose, um, but I'm not sure what that number should be. Uh, but I do think that if there was a, an exemption offered um, for a, you know, a low floor, that there would still need to be attestation that the ACO model that is being uh, experimented with or piloted or tested in the state is aligned with whatever healthcare reform efforts are happening in the state at that time. Um, so I'd want to make sure that there is alignment with that. For example, that the you know the attributed lives would contribute to scale. For example, if we were still in an all payer model world. Um, I would want to make sure that patients are made aware that their provider has joined an ACO and that there were um, educational materials given to the, the patients in that model about the model. And I would still want some submission of performance metrics, you know, uh, so that we're understanding what's happening in those ACO. And, and I think, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but along the dimensions of attribution, cost, quality, something, so we understand how those pilots are performing. Um, so that that's where I sit. Okay, thank you, Jess. I think uh, many of us uh, are waiting anxiously to hear from the healthcare advocate. So, who from the healthcare advocates office is going to um, speak? Is it you, Sam? It's me. Thanks, Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Pyche. I think most folks know me, but just for members of the public that might not, I'm a health policy analyst at the office of the healthcare advocate. So the HCA does not support an exemption from reporting requirements and guidance for Medicare-only ACOs based on size or other related criteria, primarily out of concerns for consumer protection and the public interest. It's widely accepted that compliance with reporting requirements allows state regulatory bodies to transparently evaluate the business model and approach of entities that want to operate in Vermont. It also provides a valuable opportunity for the state writ large to evaluate whether entities align with Vermont's forward thinking approaches to public health, which I've been mentioned, um, which includes seeking to achieve the quadruple aim and effectively implement the all payer model. Regarding the argument that successfully meeting reporting and guidance requirements would place an undue burden that would deter effective Medicare only ACOs from doing business in the state, we feel like it's a responsibility and duty of businesses and organizations to demonstrate their efficacy and potential benefits to Vermonters at baseline. We ask entities like hospitals, both large and small, as well as OneCare Vermont to comply with similar, similar regulatory requirements. And there's a long track record of legislation that stems from protecting the public interest in this regard. 
And presumably, were a Medicare-only ACO to exist that enhances patient experience, improves population health, reduces costs, and improves the work life of healthcare providers with an innovative approach, which I think we all want, it seems more than reasonable to assume that they could also complete reporting requirements that are before us today, um, including in the guidance. If they're truly unable to disclose this type of information or provide it, I think it'd be logical to assume that this could be a red flag for Vermonters and for regulators. Uh, I mean, we would be open to re-reviewing the guidance to potentially reduce this burden, but I don't think it's in the public's interest to prioritize claims of administrative burden over those of consumer protection, transparency, and public interest. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Are there members of the public who wish to comment at this time? Walter. Thanks, Kevin. I just want I fully agree with Sam and the H and the advocate's office on this. Um, they can't do it. They shouldn't be allowed to. Really. They've been in the news quite a lot, so there's a reason. Is there any other public comment? Wes, did you have any draft motions or were you looking for the board members to make those? I wasn't too sure what direction we were going to go, so I didn't present draft. I didn't do any draft uh, motion language for today. Well, it seems like a couple things. Um, there's not much controversy on. And just to work down the list and try to uh, um, make decisions and um, try to get us to uh, a, a final place. So I know, Robin, you're our motion master. Is there any type <laughs> of motion you would like to make at this time? Sure. Um, I. Um, I move that we approve the draft guidance adding the reference to 18 VSA 9374 and a question that the staff will develop related to the payments to providers and the land categories. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion or questions from the board? So um, for members of the public who are following, basically Robin has um, moved the first two points under discussion, but has modified the second point to require the staff to uh, come up with the um, um, actual categories and uh, um, question. Yes, and I, and I didn't include the exemption because um, I know other people have some interest in there, but I don't. So since I'm making the motion, I didn't include it. Um, certainly, nope. it, people should vote against it if that's important to them. Um, well, and I didn't I even think they would have to vote against it because there could be a, an additional motion if they wanted to. That's true. But this would at um, least first couple off the table. Okay. Uh, and then I think with the timeline, I don't think we actually have to address that um, at this time. So that's why I did not include that, just to explain. Great. And who was the second again? Jess. Okay. Um, is there further board questions or comments about the motion? Hearing none, before we vote, I just want to open it up uh, to any member of the public who wishes to offer any comment on the motion in front of us related to the first two bullets on the slide that you see in front of you. Hearing none, is there any further discussion by the board? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed signify by saying nay. Is there any board member who wishes to make any further motion at this time? Hearing none. Um, Russ, I think you uh, have the approval of the guidance along with the uh, the two changes. And um, is there anything else that you need from us at this time, Russ? Uh, no, so I think with that, um, we can make those two changes, move the guidance out of draft form and um, consider it it um, finalized and, and issued by the board unless there are, there are other concerns. I don't think there's any other concerns right now, Russ. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there any old business to come before the board? Oh, I should, sorry, um, this is Robin. The Relating to the prescription drug technical advisory group affordability subgroups <laughs> suggested recommendations that we discussed earlier, um, I did reach out to the co-chairs of the Healthcare Affordability Task Force and um, reached one of them, but not both of them. In general, I got a favorable response, so I think that we will be invited to talk about those at in front of that committee um, either this month or in November. That is great. Is there any other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.